I'm Greg Tidwell, one of the evangelists for the Church of Christ at 1130 Fishinger Road in Columbus, Ohio. Thank you for joining us for this video Bible class on effective Christian leadership. As we go through this study, we'll be following an outline from a book I wrote a few years ago, The Effective Edge. Also, as we move forward, I would like for these lessons to be engaging and addressing the questions you may have, so please be in touch. If you ask me something, I'll try to answer it in the next class. Each class will be presented on Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock through the course of this summer. I hope that you enjoy the study, and I look forward to hearing from you. Welcome back. As we continue our study, we're going to address this week two fundamental questions. First of all, who is a leader? If I were to ask you to think of a great leader from the past century, what name would come to mind? Maybe Winston Churchill, who galvanized the British and helped them to see their way through the Second World War, but then again, Adolf Hitler persuaded the German people to follow him and brought millions into the Nazi vision. Martin Luther King Jr. was a man who galvanized the civil rights movement, served as a catalyst for so much good change. But on the other hand, Joseph Stalin brought the Soviet Union into world prominence into the second most powerful nation in the world during his tenure. Ronald Reagan, known as the Great Communicator, fundamentally reshaped and directed American political culture, but Mao Zedong, Chairman Mao, with his cultural revolution, changed China, and in fact, in many ways, his vision is still being lived out by that country. So what makes the difference? What is the difference between Martin Luther King Jr. and Adolf Hitler, between Winston Churchill and Chairman Mao? What makes the difference? The difference between a leader and a tyrant is the moral focus that guides a leader's actions. More than anything else, this is what makes the difference. Lacking a moral standard, it is not possible for true leadership to exist. Uh, gangsters, the mafia, has power and organization and can be very effective in securing its ends. But such evil organizations do not have true leaders. There has to be a moral framework. Leadership is more than power. Leadership is influence for good. John Quincy Adams said, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. There is a Christian frame that comes from an understanding that God created the world, that God sustains the world, and that God will call all men into judgment. This reality of eternity and God's control provides a framework for Christians to have a moral vision. This is described for us in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory 
through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. This is the Christian moral frame. Your labor, your work is not in vain. It's not empty. It's not meaningless. Your life has meaning in Jesus Christ. And as you inspire others to look to the Lord, you are being a leader. So then, what is leadership? Leadership is helping people to a better place. And in particular, for Christians, helping them to follow Jesus Christ. The second question I want us to look at in this class, what are distinctive issues for Christian leadership? In the course of our study, we'll be looking at many things that are applicable in every area of life, but in particular for Christians, two issues rise to the top. The first of these is male spiritual leadership. This is an area where the Lord's Church is at right angles with society because the world in which we live wants to denigrate the distinctively masculine. There's a catchphrase that's being knocked around by empty heads, toxic masculinity, as if being biologically male somehow or other is poisonous. Yes, it is entirely possible for a man to be a jerk and a bully and to have horrible attributes. But it's also possible for a woman to be of low moral character. And so it is that it's not being male, it's not being masculine that's toxic. It's just being human and sinful. But the Bible is clear that men have a special place of leadership. Elders and deacons are to be husbands Evangelists, those who lead in worship, are to be men. Women are not to speak in the worship assemblies. We must never permit male spiritual leadership in the home or in the church to be removed. I've been delighted to work with the Lads to Leaders program. Uh, one aspect of this is that it helps young men and young women to develop into leaders within their own sphere. Obviously, women have leadership. Women provide leadership in the home and in the church, but not in the same way that men do. In the Lads to Leaders program, the young men learn to preach before mixed assemblies. The young ladies speak only to women. The same thing is true of song leading. The Girls will lead singing for the young ladies in order to prevent there from being any confusion about the appropriate roles. We need to encourage our young men to be leaders in the church and in their home, and we need to help women to see that their role of influence is vast and spiritual and blessed by God. Male spiritual leadership is an issue we must never surrender to this world. The second is servant leadership. And with servant leadership, we find an area where the world has embraced in part the idea of servant leadership, but there are differences. Beginning in the 1970s, especially with the groundbreaking work of Greenleaf, we find the secular world putting forward the catchphrase of servant leadership. A hierarchy of assessment as to what a leader should do. This hierarchy begins with others in a societal sense. Now, exactly what's going to inform this societal vision? Well, unfortunately, it depends upon the current fashion of the day. Sometimes it's environmentalism, sometimes it's animal rights, sometimes it's race relations or economic equity but a societal agenda being put forward. We find, for example, so much change that has come in our country regarding sexual roles has been driven by this thinking. Secondly, the secular view of servant leadership would be looking at others as individuals. 
unfortunately, they would place the need of the individual below the societal agenda, and then putting selfish considerations last. Now, this is certainly an improvement over a totally selfish agenda-driven uh, methodology of leadership where you just simply manipulate people to get them to make your life better. But on the other hand, this model is not distinctively Christian. The Christian view of servant leadership begins with God. God has given orders regarding the way in which we should conduct our lives. And as we look to God, we see, for example, regarding the environment, that we're to be good stewards. Regarding relationships, that God has revealed that he created all men and that he loves them all. Regarding the relationship between the sexes, the Bible is very clear that men are to be protective and not to be abusive of women. But all of these things, all of these societal issues, are driven by our allegiance to God. God is premier. And then others. Others societally, but more important, others as individuals. God deals with us as individuals. We stand or fall based on our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And we need to find a way of loving people as individuals, not merely seeing them as part of a larger group. Servant leadership from a Christian standpoint, under the leadership of God, is to provide a better way for other people. And in doing so, we find a better way for ourselves. Servant leadership, from a Christian standpoint, looks to God, provides betterment for others, and in doing so, we are ennobled ourselves because we are following the example of of Jesus Christ. We read of this in Philippians 2 beginning in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He took the form of a servant. We have a shared duty as Christians to follow the will of God. And God has revealed His will as being that of loving mankind and bringing as many people as we can to be with God forever. This is real servant leadership. And this is distinctively Christian. And the good news is, as we've seen earlier, God has provided everything we need for success. He has shown us the way of leadership. In our coming lessons, we're going to unfold different particulars of this, but we keep it all within the frame of the Christian moral vision. Thank you for taking part in the study. I hope you found it useful, and I hope you'll be back with us each week. Please do remember to be in touch. I'd love to hear from you, and I hope you have a blessed day.